Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Gerard Black in the Philippines with Truth. You know, when I started my magazine, uh, I usually put the whole interview in when I interview somebody. And one of the reasons being is because if that person was interesting enough to interview, then they should be interesting, interesting enough to read everything that they said. I don't parry, cherry pick what it is I'm going to print. I print the whole thing. And one of the reasons why I'm mentioning this is because I want to say thank you for those of you who have taken the time to really, you know, watch my videos. I know they're long, but, you know, I had interviewed Lamont McLemore. If you don't know who Lamont McLemore is, oh, you like my t-shirt? Good help is sometimes hard to find. <laughs> I had a housekeeper and, and she used to wash the hell out of my shirts a little too much. And um, Lamont McLemore was the founder of the Fifth Dimension. Uh, he was also the reason why Essence Magazine became Essence Magazine. Real briefly is that uh, he was a photographer and you know, uh, he started taking pictures of girls with him and his friends, and they would go to different places, in locally, but he, he took them in locations where people may have got the impression that they were traveling, but they really weren't traveling, you know? They would go to the hotel or whatever, but it looked like it. And so he launched a magazine called Elegance. And um, uh, they were having fun doing all this, and they got a publisher in New York, you know, who uh, who wanted to have more hands on with the magazine. And they decided that, you know, all they want to do is just take the pictures, get the money, play basketball, and do what they want to do, and sing. Because he, like I said, he founded the group, The Fifth, Fifth Dimension. And uh, it got to the point where he was fed up with it and just decided, I'm not going to deal with it anymore. And so he quit his own magazine. By that time, it was under um, so a Jewish publisher in New York. So what happened was that the following month, they did not skip a beat because it showed black people who were on the rise, you're living well, like middle-class blacks, all this stuff, living the good life. And uh, the publisher, the next month, changed the name of the magazine from Elegance Magazine to, you guessed it, Essence Magazine. And that's how Essence Magazine came about. Now, Lamont McLemore was also the photographer for Jet Magazine Beauty of the Week. And I know there are a lot of you who used to buy Jet Magazine just to see the Beauty of the Week that month because he was awesome about photo, uh, the way he photographed women. And um, in fact, he probably spawned generations and generations of photographers from that one page uh, uh, exhibition that he was showing of his work in Beauty of the Week. So I interviewed Lamont McLemore after showing him my magazine. And he said, my man, God, there's just so much to read. I said, yes. I said, yes. Because again, if it's not important, if you're not important enough to print everything you say, then you're not important enough to be interviewed. So, I want to add about Lamont McLemore, who was the founder of the Fifth Dimension and uh, photographer for Jet's Beauty of the Month. He was in the Navy and he got transferred onto this. PT boat, or this boat, or the ship, is one of his assignments. And when, while he was in there on the ship, one of the white officers came to him and said, I want my shoes, sir. I want my shoes shined. And Lamont said, I'm not shining your shoes. And the other black sailors said, man, don't worry about it. I shine them for you. We don't want no problems like this. And he said, no, I'm not shining shoes. And so he refused to start shine shoes. But what they didn't know 
that Lamont McLemore had read the order coming down from the military uh, department that blacks were no longer should be asked to shine white officer's shoes. So what happened was that on the ship, they had uh, gave him 30 days in the break. They locked him up in the break for 30 days, stripped him of his rank. And then after two days in the break, the captain of the ship came down and said, I'm going to let you out because he said it's my fault. He says, I never told any of the officers or anyone on the ship that there was an order now that blacks were no longer allowed to shine shoes. And they let them out of the break. So you see, you know, when you interview somebody, you know, there's, there's so much that they say, and there's so much that's cut out of the interview. And this is just one part of the story. Now, let me tell you one about the fifth dimension, quick, while I have your attention. While I have the king's ear. Um, one of the biggest songs that they did was called uh, The Age of Aquarius. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. 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 It's not bad for 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but uh, the way they got that song and how that story came about was Lamont McLemore and Billy Davis. Now, of course, the fifth dimension consists of Billy Davis Jr., Marilyn McClue, uh, Florence, uh, I can't remember her last name, and Lamont McLemore. And they were eating dinner after a show in Manhattan. So when they left, when they got back to the hotel, Billy Davis had lost his wallet. So the next day, this guy came up to Billy Davis and said, this is your wallet. And he gave him his wallet. And Billy Davis had opened the wallet and saw his money was there, all his ID was there, and everything else. So it turned out that the guy was a writer. And he gave Billy Davis and Lamont McLemore, Lamont, Lamont McLemore, say that five times, the song Aquarius. And the rest, they say, is history. Aquarius ended up in the, uh, not only in the Broadway uh play here, but also became the landmark for a whole new generation, and that was in the 60s, the age of Aquarius. So I just want to throw this in there while I'm talking about the fifth dimension. On with the video. I'll talk to you. Peace. Uh, those of you who got that magazine, uh, you probably saw uh, the article was made about four or five pages long. And the reason I say that because I want to thank those of you who have taken the time to watch my long videos all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. You know, um, I try to give you a good mixture of a lot of things, my being black in the Philippines and, and also, you know, about my life. But now I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about a Filipino girl. And this girl was not the most attractive girl around. And, and uh, she could sing. She used to sing at parties, you know, anytime karaoke thing was there, she was the, she was the first one there you know, to, to, uh, to sing. And um, this foreigner talked her into competing for one of these talent shows, and she did. And uh, much to her surprise, she won. Now, not only that, you know, uh, there was someone in the audience or someone who had seen her singing and decided that they wanted her in her in their play, in their musical. And she was so excited, they were so excited that uh, she said yes. Now because she wasn't an attractive Filipino girl, she always got a lot of jazz 
for all the other Filipino girls like uh, like this, they ain't really paying no mind because of because of how she looked. She didn't look like the rest of them who were, you know, your typical beautiful Filipino girl. So when she got this part in this play, you know, by a very, 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 very prominent uh, producer, director, you know, uh, her song that she had to sing was a song that that said that I am so pretty, I'm so pretty, I'm so pretty, happy and gay. And she was so hurt by this song because she did not feel that she was so pretty. She did not feel the words of the song. You know, so what happened was that on the premiere of the play, you know, she was terrified about going out and singing how pretty she was because you know, she really didn't feel she was that pretty. And so what she did was, was that she decided to change the costume. And what she did was that she put a pillow under her dress where it made her appear like she was she was pregnant. So, so now she can say, I'm so pretty, I'm so pretty, I'm so pretty, and gay. I'm affection. I'm a. I'm an object of my man's affection. And why is that? Because she's pregnant. And the director was outrageous. He was like, "Oh no! I, what are you doing to my play? What are you doing to my play?" And so, you know, he was so upset with her that that that, that you know. But a lot of people in the audience really liked her performance. They really loved how she sung. And so when she went backstage, he went backstage to see her, you know, she was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I, I just couldn't sing how beautiful I am when I know I'm not beautiful at all. You know, I just couldn't do it. You know, it, you know I, I just could not sing, I'm so pretty. So he, she said, I'm sorry, I, you know, I will leave the show, I, I will leave the show. And the director said, no, you stay. And you do it again tomorrow. She said, okay, I won't, you know, I won't use the pillow. He, he said, no. You do it exactly the same way as you just did it. Because people loved it. People loved the performance of, of what, what she was doing. And so anyway, so she was shocked. You know? <laughs> she was very hurt that she thought she ruined her chances of being a professional singer. And then also ruined a, 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 a production that was very big showing in Manila, very big musical production. So what happened was that when the, the director left, uh, there was a knock on the door, knock, knock, knock. And she opened the door and it was this guy standing there with these flowers. And he was so handsome. He was so, uh, how, do you, how do you say it? He was so uh, very dark. Very, you know, uh, uh, just a gorgeous looking man. And so she was saying, yes, can I help you? He said, and he had these flowers, and he said, these are for you. And she was like, for, for, for me? <laughs> for me? She was shocked that this guy, you know, liked her that much. He said, yes. He says, I really like you. He says, in fact, I like you so much, I'd like to see you again. And she was like, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. He said, yes. He says, my car is outside. He says, I will give you a ride home. And so she said, oh, okay, okay, okay. So she got this beautiful, beautiful, big limousine, uh, a car that he was driving, and drove her home. And she lived in like this real, real bad brown guy. I mean, this area, you know, that was, you know, that was, you know, very poor, very poor area. And she pulled up in front of the house in this big, big car. And all the neighbors were like, oh, die, die, come, look, 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 look. And, and her mother came, and, and her mother was like, hmm, who is this? You know, and so he brought, he brought her in, and uh, she introduced him to the family. And they all liked him. He was a foreigner, very nice, very, very tight, and everything. She was very impressive. And they were very surprised that he had liked her. So he said, okay, fine. So they started dating. 
And so she asked him, what did he do? And he said, I'm a gambler. He said, a gambler? He said, yes, you know, I travel around and I gamble. And so she thought it was kind of interesting. By this time, her profession as a singer was growing. Her profession as an actress was growing. She was getting very well known in, in the musical circles. Circles. There were articles written about her. She was on the cover of magazines. And matter of fact, the show had now become her show because of the way she could sing. And so what happened was that, you know, she um uh uh, uh, uh he, he said um, she wanted to be a sadie. Now a sadie is a, a word that means married. I want to be a married lady. A sadie is a married lady. And so uh, he told her, look, I have to go away. I have to go on this gambling trip to play cards. And so uh, he says, well, when I come back, if I win, I would make you a Sadie, a Mario. And so she was like, really, really? You will marry me, really? I said, yes, I will marry you. And so what happened was that when he went on the ship to go gamble, she couldn't take it. She couldn't take it. She could not take waiting there knowing he's playing cards and a whole future is in his hands. And so so she did what she could. You know, she got a ride. You know, she got a ship, another boat, and she boarded the same ship he was on, and she showed up she showed up at his room. And she was a mess. She had she had the same flowers that he had given her that had now wilted and, and all broken up and everything, what have you. So she she was like, hi. She said, I couldn't take it no more. So he looked at her and says, oh, my God, you can't, you know, you know, he says, okay, oh, okay. You can see, she said, just, you know, just let me watch. She said, let me watch you play cards. She said, I can't take it. I, you know, I can't take sitting there waiting and not knowing if I'm going to be a Sadie or not, if you win or lose. So he says, okay, you can watch. So she sat at the table and she was nervous like this. <laughs> she didn't know anything about the game, but, but the other players found their music because they knew who she was. They knew she was a very famous singer. You know, she was a very uh, famous stage performer and she was his. And so finally, finally, you know, they had a break and, she, and he said, look, he says, why don't you wait in the, in the, in the room? Let me do what I have to do, and then was, we'll, and when I'm finished, I will let you know. He said, "Goes, you know, you're really, you're really messing with my game." And so she said, "Okay." So she had fallen asleep, and then he came into the room, and he was looking very sad. And so she said, "Well, what happened? What happened?" And he didn't say nothing. He was sad, looking around, and all this. And so she said, tell me, tell me, I can't take it no more, tell me. And he says, well, Sadie, um, Sadie, you call me Sadie, that means I'm going to be a married lady. And he put his hand and threw all this money up in the air, all this money was coming down. And she was so happy that, oh, she's going to get married because he, he had won the jackpot that he wanted to marry her. So they got married. Now this guy's a very proud guy, a very probably very well known in, in the circle of a man among men type of thing like this. But you know, they were now calling him her last name because she was more famous and more popular than he was and he started getting resentful because he was not, he was now her husband. Not she was his wife, but he was her husband. If you understand that, you know, it's, it's like, you know, um, people will recognize her before they recognize him. And his pride started getting hurt. You know, you know, he, you know, he, he started, he started losing that spark in his eyes. He started losing that proudness because now he felt less of a man because he felt like, you know, I'm more, you know, I, you know, I'm nobody now, you know, they want her, everybody wants her, everybody wants her, you know, like this. And, and so he started trying to invest in, and, and try to make his own money. But then the gambling wasn't working anymore. He was losing money now. When he go on these cruises, you know, on, these, on these gambling boats, he was losing money. So, you know, five, they lost, they had bought this big house. 
But then, you know, because money was getting tight, you know, they had to sell it. So anyway, what happened was that, you know, uh, uh, one of the guys who, who were part of the, the gamblers said, hey, Nick, come in, Nick. I call him Nick. Nick, come here. We know you got a bad break. He, he, he had invested in a business uh, that lost a lot of money. So he said, yeah, he was in race horses and all that stuff like that. He said, yeah, we heard you lost a lot of money and all that stuff. He said, look, I have something that you can do. He said, we want you to be a front man. That means we want you to be the face of this scam, of this business, of this illegal activity. And he said, no, 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 I, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. But then he was hurting bad, badly, so bad with money. And, and, and he wanted to make his own money because at that time she was making all the money. And he felt very bad about that. You know, so finally he said, yes, okay, I'll do it. So against his better, he told her, you know, he, he told her that, you know, I'm going to do something illegal. He says, I'm just letting you know that this is my last big chance, my last big score to make a lot of money. So uh, he did it. And it turned out that the cops were waiting for him because they knew that he was not a face of this scam. So they arrested him. And so because he was so beaten and down, you know, the judge, when he was in court, says, says, uh, uh, do you plead innocent or guilty? He says, I plead guilty. He was so tired. He was just so drained. All, all the handsomeness, all the, <coughs> um, how do you say it? Um, um, I'm trying to think of a Filipino word for it. Um, uh, it, yeah, you know, it'll, call, it'll, it'll come to me. Um, wampo. <laughs> wampo means handsome. So all the wampiness has done for me, you know. And he just said, I'm guilty. And so he says, Nick, what are you doing? What are you doing? He says, no, no, no. I don't want to go home. You know, I'm guilty. He says, I, I, I did it. You know, go ahead and sentence, sentence me and what have you. So he got sentenced, I think it was like about two years. Two years in prison. And at this time, his wife was, you know, she was still getting bigger and bigger and, and more famous and more famous. But she was hurting because she missed her husband, you know, and she was sad because she felt that she was the cause of his demise. His demise because he was, you know, because she was the one who, who made him feel that he was less than because, um, you know, he was the one, you know, uh, she was the one making the money. And, you know, the guys wanted to have him open up a club and be the figurehead of, of the club, you know? And so they got some investors to invest in this club that this guy was gonna open that wanted him to be a part of the club. And so they found out that who would invest is who put up 50,000, you know, a, a 100,000 pesos. No, a 1 million pesos. Put up one million, five people put up a million pesos, million pesos, million pesos. And so when they were in that meeting, he turned to his wife and said, did you give them a million pesos? And she said, yes. And he was furious. He was like, oh, no, no, how could you? How, you know, how can you make me feel even worse the way I feel than going behind my back and trying to prop me up to be something that I'm not? And so he, that's why he, the reason behind he did the illegal thing. So anyway, two years went by. He got out of prison. So he knocked on the door in the backstage after her performance. She opened the door and you can see all the color was out of his face. All the suave, debonair, you know, a wumble was gone. He was a beaten man, he was down. And she was happy to see him. Oh, Nick, oh, I'm so happy to see you. 
Oh, I miss you so, so much. Oh, I miss you, I miss you, I miss you, I miss you, I miss you. And so she, you know, he asked her, what are you gonna do? And she asked him, come back, you know, come back home. She said, at that time they had a, a daughter. She said, come back home. We miss you, we want you back home. We want you back home with us. Do we wanna be a family again? And she says, will you come back? And he stepped by the door. And he said, if you want to know what happened to the story, rent the movie Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand. That's the movie I just described to you. I wanted to, to, to kind of talk to you about what things would be good to watch with your Filipino girl. We watched it and it was an excellent, excellent movie. There are others who are just up. You don't have to watch all the shoot em up, bang, bang, type of things like that. There are other good movies that I'm gonna try to clue you in on. That when you're sitting home and chilling with the one you love, watch movies that, that make you feel, that touch you. This is Gerard Black in the Philippines with the truth. Remember, dreams are nothing more than plans of waiting action. Never disrespect the elevator. And always pull something up. And sometimes, sometimes you're the only one to see a vision. And if you're lucky enough to have a woman like Ollie Woodson, formerly singer of the Temptation One Son, treat her <laughs> like a lady. <laughs> and ladies, if you're lucky enough to have a good man like me, Make me feel like a king. I'll leave you with one more thought. Filipino women. Feel like no other. But if you have one, if you're not making love to her every day or every other day, no three days should pass without tapping that ass. I'll talk to you later. Peace. Remember, I'll always, always love you more. And we're getting close. We're getting close to that sex in the Filipino world. I'll talk to you later. Tell you to welcome to Gerard Black in the Philippines yeah. with their truth. <laughs> uh, a lot of you are my tennis players. A lot of them uh, beat me badly. <laughs> but one day they say in order for you to get good, you gotta play with players better than you, and they're all better than I am. But you know, yeah, you know, I uh, I've always I've always looked for one woman. And I come to the Philippines, and as many times I asked so many girls to marry me, you know, <laughs> none of them said yes. So I, I am happy to take this time out to feel that I found the girl as Jermaine Jackson once sung. And at this time, I want to. I want to. Hey, what? Uh, <laughs> And as old as I am, I'm going to try to get down on one knee without falling the boat. This is 
a small token. Mag-engage na lang po Just a small token. So, Yeah. Ay, <laughs> <Bukang te. laughs> It's small, but it's yen. It's a protocol. My friend died. I one more, one more. <laughs> okay, so that's for our black and the Philippines with the truth. I just want to share this moment and keep it forever. To all my friends, their family, we just got through eating a good meal. <laughs> if you ask me what it was, I couldn't tell you, but all I know it was good. Okay, so I'll be right back. Thank you, Carlos, on the camera. I'll talk to you later. Bye.